and we are recording now. Uh, welcome back to AKRX channel. This is uh, uh, me, AKRX, with you, your host, and uh, we have. I'm here with a special guest, uh, Sora Kohn, aka Jeffrey Bond, aka educational curator from Utah in a museum uh, and a dinosaur park. And also, we are going to continue from where we pretty much left off last time and expand on some of the topics. Jeffrey, how are you doing today? Everything good? Oh, yeah. yeah everything seems to be going hunky dory. <laughs> Oops, um, sorry, click the wrong button on my timer thing. But yeah, anyways, um, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to just say that last time people were asking us some questions that we haven't been able to address, and uh, especially, and uh, you know, in regards to like Raptor X, for example. And I remember you had a whole thing reserved for it specifically. And uh, since that was mentioned, I thought, why don't we just start from Tyrannosauroidea in general and uh, just talk about things that come to mind related to this particular clade and family overall and just point out whatever we can think of right off the bat and uh, let's see where it takes us. So, Alrighty. Yeah, do, do you want to just open up what are your first thoughts when you look at the basically families? Note that we only have two, so far two identified families. One of which is obviously the true Tyrannosaurus, which is Tyrannosaurida, and then we have Proceratosaurids, which are Tyrannosauroidea, but uh, with with a few weird things about it that just uh, I can't help but wanting to scratch my head about them. So, what are your thoughts about the positioning and the reliability of relationship, and generally the premise of how this whole thing has been, you know, uh, come to pass, so to speak? Okay. Well, um, I think it's really great how, uh, as we've been exploring a lot more regions, we've started to get a lot more information on some of the things that make these animals so mysterious. But we talk about Tyrannosaurus rex as an icon so much, it's really easy to forget that Tyrannosauridae is well known, but outside of that, uh, Tyrannosauroidea and Proceratosauridae, uh, we know very little about it. We've had some quantum leaps forward and understanding, you know, just their, their, their uh, physical makeup, uh, also their evolution and, and so on and so forth. Um, it's really kind of an exciting time to be looking at these animals, not just because Tyrannosaurus Rex is very definition of awesome. <laughs> so, um, yeah, go uh, ahead. Let's see. Sorry. Uh, with, with Tyrannosauroidea, I, I think one thing that is a common misconception is that uh, with all of this new knowledge, uh, we'll kind of jump to the other the other conclusion. Um, like just a few decades ago, we couldn't say you know, where Tyrannosaurs exactly came from. Uh, we could say that they were pretty similar to, to guys like Stoxosaurus, and that means they're probably Silurosaurus, but we're not sure, and you know, so on and so forth. But just in like, you know, 30, 40 years, that's completely changed. But now people are jumping to the other side and saying, oh, yeah, our, our understanding of uh, a Tyrannosauroid evolution is rock solid. And it's, it, it's still pretty darn vague. Uh, one of the more recent phylogenies I'm familiar with would be the one in a paper describing Despletosaurus uh, hornery. And that one... Uh, the um, Spleosaurus hornery into uh, previous phylogenetic matrices and kind of recalculated things. And, and they went back over the phylogeny to calculate um, how liable those uh, hypotheses would be. Um, with Stuff that we've been studying for a century, like you know, Albertosaurus and Tyrannosaurus and Despletosaurus, those relationships were up in the um, 80s and 90s. 
uh, in terms of like say a percentage, like 100% being absolutely certain, getting like you know high 80s and 90s, you're you're pretty sure that Tyrannosaurus and Tarbosaurus are sister taxa. Okay. But uh, you're getting down to a how Apalachosaurus gets into the mix, how Delong gets into the mix, how uh, Proceratosauridae in general fits into the mix. Now you're starting to get numbers that are like maybe in the low 60, uh, you know, between 50% and 60%. So there's a lot of uh, uncertainty there. Um, another note on, on those percentage numbers, um, that's kind of a likelihood that a new description would uh, change things, or rather, let me back up. I, <laughs> I went backwards there. Um, yeah, that's okay, no problem. The, the percentage is the likelihood that it would remain the same in light of a new discovery. And so, um, like, if we were to find a new anasauroid somewhere in the base, um, is 80% likely or 90% likely, I can't remember the exact number, but uh, saying that Spletosaurus is a sister taxon to uh, Tyrannosaurus slash Dorbosaurus, that, that little group. Uh, that's 90% certain to stay the same. Uh, if you were to go down to, say, like... Um, and I... Don't quote me on this. I'm just trying to illustrate. But uh, um, you go more basal in the tree, like how Proceratosauridae uh, is related to the rest of Tyrannosauroids, and uh, certain uh, chance that it would remain the same would be only 60%. Still likely to stay the same, but there's a 40% chance that a new discovery could change that tree. So, our understanding of Tyrannosauroid evolution is not an equal across the board sort of a thing. Uh, that there are certain aspects of that that we are still uh, pretty sure we've got a lot to learn on. So uh, basically from uh, uh my perspective when i was looking at the trees and how they were illustrated and how well uh, each area of the so-called tree is uh, explained you know in terms of how these things relate i noticed one funny thing it's almost like the tyrannosauridae so the true tyrannosaurus basically so to speak they are the ones as if they're like showing us um, uh, showing us the what would it look like at the end while I'm struggling, obviously, to see any clarity in what would it be for them truly like in the beginning, because every idea that is proposed, it relies on very fragmental material. Oh, yeah. not, not just individual specimen material as such, but more so on the lack of taxa showing what was the uh, megafauna like in, in this group in a specific time periods, which is why we see a lot of gaps, you know, we see a lot of these, like almost 40 or something like that, million years gaps between families and uh, some tax. Although it's interesting as well to note that some taxa like Apalachiosaurus, for example, or Dryptosaurus, they were still around, uh, you know, when the true Tyrannosaurids already were blossoming, basically, you know, were all like thriving. So it's not like they disappeared and morphed into these. So we do see that certain lineages of them just went separate ways in different directions. The big question I have, and I haven't been able to really find anything that can answer it to the best of my satisfaction, um, it's what was the true occurrence of the split in the tree, at which point it happened, and which tree branch exactly as well. You know, those are the things that I'm still not quite satisfied with when I try to look for answers in that, say. 
Uh, and, and you're talking about the split of Tyrannosauroidea from uh, Silurosauridae? I'm talk yeah, I'm talking about that as well. So basically, you know when um, they, there is a claim generally, or, or how they are presenting it, that Tyrannosauroidea is Silurosaur, uh, you know, part of Silurosauria. So, Silurosauria, yeah, I messed it up. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't worry about it. Uh, and uh, the, then at which point do we know they start branching off you know which taxon maybe gave you know rise to that and then when we start going into Tyrannosauroidea at which point do we see uh, that uh, the uh, branches like Tyrannosaurida came out of which taxon you know what I mean because I, yeah. I do not see any kind of common if you are going to say that uh, Proceratosaurids and Tyrannosaurids and all of the other "Quote unquote Tyrannosauroidea, free roaming tax. If they are supposed to be related, then there should be at least one point where they would have all growing from the same branch in terms of the common ancestry that should be traced. And I'm not. I'm finding myself in a position where I cannot really go back to that sort of step unless I'm missing something right in front of my face. I cannot actually see where that's actually coming from, and that's my biggest problem with." trying to use this uh, model as a way to demonstrate not just relationship but just generally rely on it as much as it is i mean it demonstrates that we have certain amount of tax and families however obscure or complete whatever um, it's not perfect by far it's actually pretty bad to be honest with you if we were to ask my opinion <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's just that the very idea of reliance on it both among the actual, you know, scientific peers, so people who are actually, you know, doing the work, and the community, so people like, you know, the casual community members like myself uh, and others who are just basically consuming the uh, work that has been produced and put out there, right? I find that to be a common thing uh, in the community, and uh, I just uh, can't help at saying to myself that I, 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 I can't quite uh, subscribe to it like that. You know, it just doesn't, it, it doesn't convince me. You know, it, may be, it might make sense, it might be true, but I've not seen anybody actually be able to demonstrate why and how it can be true uh, to, uh, to the level where I can be satisfied that it's consistent and that it's well supported and founded, other than just, this is what I think, and that's where it basically goes into long conversations which do not actually examine the evidence, do not reliably test the hypothesis, at least not to the level of reliability I would personally want to see. Uh, well, you just articulated the uh, general frustration of being dinosaurs. <laughs> the answers that you're looking for there, fossil record has not provided them yet. Oh. <laughs> There's a ton of stuff that is still out there for us to discover. There's always a, a good possibility that even well-established uh, taxonomic frameworks be completely overturned. Uh, think of back to two, uh, 2017 um, and revival or, of Ornithoscolita. That that was. Sariscia, uh, Ornithischia, that that whole uh, um, topology there, that was well backed and solid, and and uh, that was the way things were. And if something like even that can be challenged, to the degree that it has been, and now um, not only do you have some scientists saying, "Yeah, that's the way it goes," but uh, you've got studies saying. Statistically, there's really very little difference between the traditional Risky Ornithischia split and uh, the Orth Ornithoscolita um, a Sauropoda split or Risquia split. Um, and then the third one, grouping all the meat eaters together and then all the plant eaters together, and then that's the split. Like, if we can't get that straight, then how can we really trust anything uh, beyond that? The point that a lot of people miss is that the phylogeny isn't there be 
trusted like that. It, it's not an authority. Uh, when you use cladistics, generate billions of plausible outcomes, and then you use statistics to figure out which ones are the most likely. Narrow that down. So we're working off of a statistical likelihood, but you always have to test that against the fossil record, and that's one reason why these trees change uh, just about every time you find a new uh, taxon. Um, Tyrannosauroidea, uh, th th there's kind of a funny thing. I, I, I mentioned that uh, um, Carr et al. 2017 uh, on the hornery uh, was the more recent phylogeny I was aware of. It, it's, that one was for just tyrannosaurs. There was another one uh, conducted... Oh, um, in the description for Hesperornithoides, um, a new little homeosaur slash truodontid. They, they were very vague on what, uh, what clade they wanted to uh, place it in um, and spent the whole paper explaining why they were kind of vague on that. But to Im didn't look at tyrannosaurs very closely. But some of the preliminary stuff, just one little sentence in there said that they found that since they were focusing so much on the more derived uh, silurosaurs, at the silurosaurs at the base it ended up with some interesting results. And Proceratosauridae, that analysis apparently ended up outside of uh, Tyrannosauroidea. So, stuff like this will shift all the time. Um, that's one reason why you need to be really, really careful about trying to reconstruct um, extinct taxa based on uh, phylogenetic bracketing. So, if you're going to try to do that, it always depends on how solid your phylogenetic hypothesis is. Sometimes it doesn't make much of a difference, and you can use phylogenetic bracketing to come up with a really a solid sort of a hypothesis. A lot of times those hypotheses test well uh, against the fossil record when we uh, get a new discovery. But not all brackets are created equal and a lot of scientists even tend to misunderstand and misuse that when they come up with these hypotheses and then they'll misrepresent it as oh this is a really solid hypothesis and holes when the fact checking well um the funny thing is as well it's um i noticed that this uh, this the whole thing I mean, again, I'm just saying based on what I observe and what I get sent, you know, by people when they come across something on Twitter, you know, or whatever, because Twitter's become like a thing where everybody seems to engage in different kind of discussions, and a lot of them are unfortunately a lot of words, but not a lot of substance. And, but um, well, that's Twitter. I guess that's what it's for, really. Oh, yes. Partially the reason why I quit it completely, because it was just useless to me in general. And then it just kind of... Uh, it, it just really uh, serves no purpose for me. So that's why. Doesn't mean everybody else should stop using it, but I would encourage it anyway if I can, because <laughs> it's an absolute cesspool. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's as far away detached from reality as uh, it possibly can be. Uh, potentially competing with Hollywood, but Hollywood is on Twitter as well, so there we go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, uh, not to shoehorn that in, but the main point I was trying to make is that um, I see a lot of times that discussions seem to derail a lot with just, uh, you know, uh, just shouting and screaming about uh, whether or not this should be the valid taxon or this or that, and then it just kind of becomes more like a slinging contest and... Uh, but I don't see any actual, you know, arguments being produced, you know, like I, I, I was trying to read some of it that I, that I got sent to by people and uh, 
some of them of course remain very civil and polite and that's a good thing and you know i always respect that at least but still neither side produces arguments you know that can be considered for something you know that can at least push the conversation a bit more forward it almost seems like whenever at least one side maybe tries to do something about it the other just tries to push it back to square one as if you know when you have to when you already understand that something is not quite working properly in your argument and uh, it's being addressed and for you to acknowledge it means that you have to keep going forward and eventually you have to basically um, put your own position under scrutiny and obviously a lot of times i notice that people don't like to do that and that's why they try to always go back to the beginning again so they can just you know hope that maybe if they repeat something they said in a different rhetoric or a different approach it might just you know maybe get heard better i don't know and i have a problem with how people argue quite a lot of times personally that's probably my no. thing it's something that i've noticed that i started develop a lot more than even say when i first started my channel you know i um i i never used to actually pay as much attention in how people actually argue i was more about you know focusing on your argument is wrong my argument is right what the hell is your problem you know so to speak that was my <laughs> kind of approach to it and then i started slowly shifting more into the idea of not only whether the argument is right or wrong but the thing is um you cannot convince the person uh, the opposition uh, in the validity or uh, correctness so to speak of your argument because uh, that's not enough uh, you have to demonstrate it and that's when we start asking how do you arrive to the conclusion which is what we talked about last in the last session uh, quite a bit and uh, we are slowly kind of going back to this again uh, that a lot of times i notice that it seems that the generally uh, the standards of the of this have lowered somewhat and uh, i'm just trying to kind of work out whether or not whose responsibility is it really if there is any way objectively to define a role of who should be responsible you know for setting the standard of these kind of discourses you know so that we can clearly understand what is acceptable what's not acceptable uh, what which ideas work which don't what's the ethics of debating how do we go about it uh, you know so that it's it's just complete it's just so it's easy so we don't have to waste our time on and breath on things that are just not really worth it like the basics of how burden of proof works the basics of understanding how to test hypothesis and why it's important to understand how conclusion is achieved and etc and why methods are important for fuck's sake you know all of these things so what are your thoughts on that i, I hope i haven't lost you there with my rambling but <laughs> what are your what are your thoughts on this it's uh i, I don't want to turn this into into a mantra because uh, that that kind of ends up being an argument that supports itself by sheer repetition uh do that way too often in uh, popular culture anyway. But, uh, I, I've said it before and I'll say it again. You know, uh, if you want to understand the validity of an argument, you need to look at how it was constructed. How is, is always the most important. And this is coming from my background in uh, not only... Uh, debate. I, I used to debate in high school. Um, also, uh, my studies in rhetoric, my degree is actually in English, or rather all my degrees are, are in English. Um, so, looked a lot at how people talk, and particularly about how people talk about science. Uh, there's an excellent source if you ever look up uh, Tolman, and I'll get this in here, but it's T-O-U-L-M-I-N. Uh, Tolman was a, a rhetorician, and he developed theory that lets you kind of dissect um, somebody's argument and figure out, you know, what's a claim, what's evidence for the claim, what are uh, counterproposals and 
there are all sorts of different uh, categories. You can uh, match the statements of any individual argument uh, to. And if, if you train yourself, it becomes quite easy to look at text and figure out how that text is working, all those words are working together, provide a, a conclusion. Um, if you're interested in looking it up, I can um, command Purdue's, uh, Purdue University's online writing lab. Uh, if you uh, Google Owl Purdue, uh, that'll, that'll get you to where you can get some good information on them. So oftentimes, if you Remember last session how we were uh, talking about scientific evidence is? Uh, scientific evidence has to be physical, measurable, and independently verifiable. If you go through uh, an argument and people are supporting claims with that kind of evidence, that's a good sign that you're getting a scientific argument. If you're getting claims that are being backed by other kinds of reasons, no matter whether it's coming from a scientist, no matter whether it's using uh, whether it's using scientific terminology or anything else, it's, it, it can't be scientific. Claim is not founded in a, a basis of scientific evidence. Um, I'll give you a good example because it just happens to be the one on my mind. But, uh, I was looking at promotional material for the American Museum of Natural History's um, uh, Tyrannosaur exhibit. Uh, since we're talking about tyrannosaurs. Oh yeah, the, the, the dreaded one that I remember slammed a while back on my channel, Wait. just, just to, in case people haven't watched the video. <laughs> a lot Video. It's, it, it's I, I worth... slammed it quite hard, and I think I was actually being nice, though. But yeah, sorry. Continue. <laughs> like I, I have, I've done diligent search in trying to figure out the claims of that exhibit are, and what their basis is for those claims. Um, and I can't say that I've got a full scholarly uh, knowledge of what's going on there. Uh, what I have able to glean uh, like a video uh, that they put out to publicize uh, its exhibit um, the lead scientist is explaining why they put uh, an awful looking toupee of ported feathers on their uh, adult uh, tyrannosaur specimen or, you know, even made their, their, their baby entirely fuzzy. What is that stuff doing there? And reason that he gave in that video was he feel it would have had feathers because of you Tyrannus. That was it. But what that argument boils down to is that since another animal has feathers, Tyrannosaurus rex must have feathers. It's not a logical conclusion. <laughs> I, I can't shoehorn it into logic. And the fact that they said that they feel, again, that is a, a very clear tag that that is not a scientific argument. Put those feathers on there because they felt like it. And they said they felt like it. Despite that, if you go on their Facebook page, or at least you went there uh, four months ago, uh, like scroll down through the comments on uh, their post, posts on that, and you will see people say, oh, a museum says that Tyrannosaurus Rex had feathers, therefore it's good enough for me. Oh, right, so um, can, I, can I, I'm sorry, I'm really sorry, Jeff, to interrupt, but um, uh, can I just interject here with 
one of the favorite pet peeves, and I think the reason why I, you know, had the audacity to just like slide slide in like this is because it's a common thing me and you both share, as I know from experience of our constant communication. Uh, it's called the appeal to authority. I believe this is something that is kind of slowly streaming into right now, isn't it? This topic. Well, well and um, we also have that uh, interest in the Middle Ages, and that's the most hilarious thing. Like, I one of the uh, focuses of studies in uh, English. Uh, was ancient British literature, and you get a lot of people, you know, saying, "Oh, yeah, we go medieval on something," and a lot of people will, re will reject the thinking of the Middle Ages because it's authoritarian. And yeah, that's true. It's very much authoritarian based. There are lots of cultures that uh, will, will, will base. Uh, the veracity of a claim on the authority of who said it. And there are reasons why, in modern culture, uh, we, we've decided to reject that. Or at least, uh, we've done that in name. But when it comes to practice, you're still very much in that evil habit of saying, Well, you know, scientist so-and-so has a PhD, therefore, what I... he says must be true. I remember I actually, uh, I'm pretty sure I roasted one or two people who just came in and they were those, you know, uh, I, I decided to make up my own meme at this point, you know, how there is an orange man bad meme, not to bring politics into here, so yeah, uh, Rex man bad, you know, geek man bad, like, uh, so th 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 there are those type of people who just come in and they start um, screeching their nonsense and... One of the common ones I've seen was uh, when I was doing like a video response to Trade the Explainer about uh, his video that he produced on um, uh, Bella Tautis at 2017. So that was like way, that's basically when my channel kind of took off in a way uh, to where it is now. And um, there was other ones as well. Whenever I did any kind of opinions that were going, so to say, against the grain of these, uh, you know, of this cult mentality of the you know, in fluffing, I always got these comments about how, but you don't have a PhD. Why? Why are you saying these things? Why do you say these mean things about these people? You know, like, it's just like some nonsense like this. And uh, I just uh, started dismantling it and uh, just started asking a few questions about, okay, so if a person has PhD, so this person has PhD, and then this person has PhD. So if you say that this person who has PhD said this, therefore it must be true, does that mean that something that a different person who also has a PhD says, which is a completely mutually exclusive argument with the other person who has PhD said, right? Mm -hmm. Can they be right at the same time if their arguments are mutually exclusive? Or maybe... Uh, looking at the presence or absence of the said PhD does not really give us the tools to work out which argument and which claim is more reliable. Right. Hey, and oh, I won't say that you can't use um, examinations of authority to learn about an argument. It, that's certainly not a scientific way of going about it. Science is very much objective. And so it doesn't matter who says what. What matters is whether an argument has a basis in physical reality according to scientific evidence or not. So you know, that, that's kind of the funny thing. And, and one reason why uh, paleontology actually is really pretty friendly towards um, uh, amateur paleontologists. If you can produce uh, a solid syllogism, if you can produce solid scientific work, it doesn't matter whether you've got the PhD, uh, you, you can still get published. So fortunately, uh, in, in that regard, 
it's paleontology has not become uh, that tribalistic. But that's one reason why I worry about it becoming tribalistic because we do sometimes have scientists straight up say, if you don't have a PhD, you're not welcome here. But that's not a scientific argument. So forward it is a scientific argument. If you're going to make that subjective uh, appeal to authority and own that, call it subjective, and you know, let, let the chips fall where they may. I feel that uh, scholarship just benefits from that kind of self-honesty. Can use subjective um, measures to figure out how far you can trust an idea. Um, I also have a little bit of background in folklore, not much, but a little bit. And uh, some of these uh, pattern of the claims in certain uh, controversies on dinosaurs uh, often has a folklore reasoning behind it rather than scientific. Um, whole debate over Nanotyrannus, for example. Oh, yeah. Plenty of the, the dreaded go. debate, yeah. Yeah, and, and as far as the science goes, like I'm, I can't say one way or another. I, it doesn't seem to me like uh, like the proponents for Nanotyrannus have necessarily uh, produced a very solid scientific case. There are some observations that they have forward that, that really make me scratch my head, um, and so you know I'm willing to consider that Nanotyrannus uh, could be a valid uh, genus. It's just don't know, don't feel comfortable that they've um, come up to the uh, scientific standard of uh, demonstrating uh, that this is uh, validity. And you'll notice I said I'm not comfortable with, so that that is a subjective yeah. opinion right there. Yeah, same here. I'm. Uh, I get asked a lot on my channel, by the way, by my subscribers about the stance on this debate and. I just pretty much refuse to comment directly in terms of like, no, I don't refuse to comment, I do comment something, but uh, I refuse to take a definitive stance and uh, a reason for doing so is because I'm not satisfied by uh, either of the claims of whether it's its own taxon or whether or not it's, uh, you know, a Tyrannosaurus rex, uh, but a juvenile Tyrannosaurus rex, because uh, new evidence still has not really you know, showed up to the level of that would make me, you know, that would satisfy what I, again, once again, what I would consider to be a good, you know, examination of the claim, either side. And because, uh, for example, I would really appreciate if there were more specimens, perhaps a better specimen library out there to... Uh, expand, you know, the testing material uh, to expand on uh, more because you see uh, they have only what a couple skulls, maybe a skeleton, and some of them are also in private uh, ownership, not available because of the limitations of the current code of ethics of the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology. They cannot uh, gather any data. Um, no ma doesn't matter how good it will be or not, but uh, they just don't do it. Uh, well, not that they don't do it, they do it actually, so that would be an ab absolute BS if I said they don't do it. Uh, but um, there are examples when they did it with some specimens, and everybody still alive and well, nobody died from it, so to speak. But the um, uh, point I'm making is that they seem to forward this idea that that's not how it should be done. And uh, okay, that's fine, uh, but uh, in this case, uh, well, in this case, what can I say, guys? You got bad news. You're stuck. Um, so, when you sort that out, you let me know, so to say, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and, you know, part, part of the problem is uh, the holotype is, is the Cleveland skull. You've got some uh, referred specimens, um, and so uh, won't get into all the complexities of, of that. Uh, but kind of the, the main point that I wanted to make is that uh, Nanotyrannus is slowly becoming a referendum on academic paleontology versus commercial paleontology. And you look at uh, the language of how those arguments are being presented 
what comes first, uh, not just in, in, in the, um, in the, the official published scientific literature, but when any, whenever any of the, the people involved in the debate, uh, professionally talking with each other, that's really where things start to go. Um, and I think that that is a danger of that uh, starting to skew the science. Um, scientists start focusing on uh, whether nanotyrannus is ethical or not. That's a distraction. Uh, really, if we're going to say there's a scientific basis for nanotyrannus, we need to keep things fairly on but the physical, measurable, um, dependently verifiable, verifiable evidence actually says. And right now, there's not a whole lot of clarity with that. There are good arguments on either side. There are bad arguments on either side. And it's just kind of a muddy sort of a situation right now. Um, do hope that uh, the dueling dinosaur specimen will end up in a museum and that uh, crossing fingers, once it does, that will provide enough evidence to finally lay this thing to rest. Unfortunately, if we continue to use this uh, debate as a referendum on something unrelated, uh, those unrelated issues will still exert influence over how we view that taxon. It's a shame. It is, and um, it's it's also another thing that I just wanted to really mention. I noticed there is another argument that I see going on quite a lot. And again, uh, whenever I got sent all these screen caps by a variety of different people, I don't want to put any names out there. Just you know, people know who they are when they, if they're listening, and um, to which I'm grateful because it's you know whatever I see, it's information. You know what I mean? It's information can always come in handy from time to time, but. Uh, uh, the the point I'm trying to say here is that I see that uh, there is one side, uh, and uh, Dr. Carr is particularly a very strong defender of the idea that uh, we should follow the code of ethics and not use any uh, or collect any data from the privately owned specimens. So that's a taboo, basically. And if it's in a private institution, in a private hands, and that's actually somehow related even, well, not somehow, but directly related also in spe specimens that are currently under the ownership of uh, Black Hills Institute because it's actually a private institution. It's uh, not, you know, owned uh, by the state, so to speak. And this is where I kind of have a, a problem with both sides um, uh, in the sense that I, uh, you know, I can understand that we want to somehow find a way to discipline or, you know, the um, standards of some sort that will allow us to give us more reliable means to get the information. But uh, then we're risking going into a dangerous territory. Like, I'll give you an example, which I found out when I was in Rostov and I went to Azov Museum to take some pictures for uh, Harry, uh, who is also a member of this forum, by the way, uh, from Australia. And uh, he wanted, he asked me to take pictures of, uh, uh, what's, what's his name, Elasmotherium uh, Cauc Caucasium. And um, this was a really um, uh, interesting uh, experience for me when I found out that apparently in Russia, generally as a law overall, if you find any scientific specimen of, uh, uh, you know, you know, um, hold on a second. Can you? Can we? Yeah. Thank you. I was gonna say. Can we mute the mics, please? Uh, and uh, if you find a specimen, even if it's on your private land, and they the state deems it to be a valuable specimen to science, by law you are required to give it up to state and place it in a state's museum collection. And uh, uh, that's one of those things that. I uh, kind of, you know, I disagree with in the sense that uh, are we supposed to basically, uh, you know, invade people's personal... Okay, okay, let's try to approach it from more of a 
you know, let's respect the person's right, you know, to his own land and property and maybe try to approach him with a deal. Maybe we can, you know, recognize him, you know, his contribution. Maybe we can reward the said person for doing this. Yeah, I understand it's a coincidental find. He didn't plant it there or he didn't, you know, exactly water the trees to make the fruit grow there, you know, and in forms of fossils. Uh, so it's not entirely his credit just because it happened to be there. But at least uh, do something about it because you are still impeding on people's private land. And um, I am a very strong proponent of this idea that we should respect people's personal freedoms and not sacrifice them for whatever we consider to be, uh, you know, uh, greater good or not. You know, because that's a very subjective term. And I think objectively intruding on people's privacy just to collect the said specimen uh, because he cannot have it because I said so, because there's obviously not going to be a very good objective standard to what contributes a value to science, because who is the arbiter of that? Again, I have a question on that. And uh, with all that said and done, I think uh, it's important for people who try to place those kind of ideas to not cross that line, because I would not want to see, for example, paleontology in the West to go down the same route like the people in, you know, that the state in Russia has done. They basically just take it from you. So if they find that you hold, like, say, a mammal skull of some sort, you know, uh, because you found it on your property, uh, it's not like you can, you know, beat it on the auction or you can get rewarded for it or have or be recognized for finding the specimen somehow and credit it, you know, as, con as a contributor to science. Um, but they'll just take it and that's it, end of story, you know, they just come in and take it, and if, if by force, if necessary. So, uh, I have problem with that, personally, and at the same time I understand that uh, we don't want to kind of go down this trope when uh, it becomes kind of, you know, okay to have things that are definitely more valuable to scientific community, to research, and it ends up basically just being collecting dust in some celebrity's mansion. So there is another side to it. And obviously, I think it's going to be very difficult for people to agree on what is the right way to go about it. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, um, quite <laughs> when you're talking scientific ethics, uh, especially when they intersect with political ethics and other oh man it, it is definitely a minefield and it's like one it, mine on top of another you know even if you avoid, evade one you're always gonna step on the other one yeah bouncing three-dimensional <laughs> three yeah, it's, it's like a, it's like a three-dimensional <laughs> mine yeah <laughs> um and you know, ha having having work in the profession uh, the, it really is uh, a difficult thing to try and balance those different needs, especially when they come into conflict. Um, oh, I, I can't give any one issue uh, justice uh, within whatever time limits we have. Um, you could talk entire career about uh, ethics and what people should and shouldn't do with fossils in order to make sure that uh, the science can get done properly. But, uh, just to throw out uh, an example, in a paleontologist in Utah, I've seen a lot of reactions to the Trump administration's um, uh, ants we say, on Grand Staircase, Escalani um, National Monument, and uh, Bears Ears National Monument. Um, I, I have seen the gamut of opinions on how exactly that works, and I have looked through source documents to see how that works, because that affects my career, that, that affects me professionally, that affects a lot of my colleagues professionally, and uh, everybody's going to have uh, a lot of different opinions. One thing that I can say is that I am constantly seeing stuff on the internet that oversimplifies uh, the situation. Um, 
this is not an orange man bad sort of a thing. Uh, there's a whole lot of bad. Um, it's not even about orange man good thing either, by the way, for those who are listening. We're not praising or criticizing, we're just trying to point out the raw facts in case people listening and trying to potentially thinking that, oh, what are you guys doing? This is not also, ju just to understand, it's a disclaimer here, sorry to interject, Jeffrey, just put a disclaimer here quickly that we're not trying to bring politics into it, we're just sort of trying to look at the difficulties that may come down to the professional side of things when you work like Jeffrey does in uh, the field. So, sorry, Jeffrey, carry on. Yeah. <laughs> well, and um, to make my opinion on Orange Man <laughs> perfectly clear, uh, when he was elected, I uh, put it on my uh, Facebook uh, page, uh, congratulations, America, you just elected um, Tannen for president. So, thing is, is that I'm going to be fair with, with each of these decisions. And to be honest, uh, in Grand Staircase Escalani um, National Monument was aid, I thought that the Clinton administration uh, skipped a bunch of vital um, ups and that they made a really bad decision. A lot of good has come out of it, though. Um, this isn't just about presidential uh, administrations. This is what, what the people who live there do about it. To be honest, I'd pref I, I would have preferred that the Trump administration had done nothing in regards to Grand Staircase uh, Golani National Monument. I, I need to Shorten that down. Anyway. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, so, I'm pretty sure there will be some people who will be on a different side of the spectrum and uh, they will probably have their own opinions, as, well, as you said as well. So, right. And uh, my point, what I want to summarize here, that's again, I want to avoid getting into the nitty gritty picks. I'm pretty sure you have a lot to say about the political side of it, but I want to kind of. We're kind of walking on the knife's edge here a little bit because I try to keep <laughs> politics away from it. But uh, so long as um, it's not just, you know, raw politics in itself, but it's actually relevant to how it can directly specific things rather than just say this man bad because he said and did this and therefore I suffer. But more so how this may be specific construction or this specific policy in isolation in itself affects it. Yeah, it may happen under... Trump's administration, it may have happened under somebody else's administration. We don't know if it would have happened or not because we cannot predict alternative, you know, routes to things. But um, right. uh, we, I, I'm, just trying to, I'm, I'm just trying to talk facts. Yeah, yeah, just raw facts. Yeah. So, uh, and the guys as well, by the way, just so you know, there are many people in our, you know, crew, so to speak, who have a variety of different takes on different things. The beauty of us being still kind of talking to each other and not pointing fingers and hounding each other over whatever opinions we support and whatever things we like about it or don't like, it's that we are we respect and we will defend each other's right to have those opinions. We may disagree with the opinions, but we defend each other's right to have these opinions. Hey. Oh, um... My preference would have been that the Trump administration had done nothing the Grand Staircase. Um, too many changes of administration within such a, a small window of time um, that it's going to have a, a poor effect on uh, what happens with the land. The, the, these policy decisions do have... Um, physical uh, consequences. Um, they're just, they are going to change things. So that would have been my preference. They change things up anyway. That's what happened. As far as Bears Ears goes, um, I would have preferred, though I think the Obama administration did a better job of following the procedures of creating a national monument, um, I still think that it was probably too large, and that not everybody's voice was heard. That being said, um, I don't mind that that was changed so much. But on a particular detail, 
it really, um, really made me question uh, the administration's decision and the reasoning behind it. That they said that there are outcroppings in the Morrison Formation in Bears Ears because there's good representation of the Morrison outside of that area. There wasn't a good reason to preserve it under the uh, monument law. And that presumes that all sections of the Morrison are pretty much the same. They're not. Uh, Don DeBlue, who um, uh, he, he's uh, a member of the Utah Geological Survey's uh, scientific uh, paleontology um, branch, said that they uh, went scouting in that area and they found an area with a lot of Morrison plant fossils. You know anything about the Morrison Formation? That is a rarity. We don't get a lot of plant fossils in most places in the Morrison. Find a quarry that has abundant plant evidence, that is something that is rare and worthy of preservation and government protection. Uh, speaking of government protection, there is a huge um, understanding on what exactly uh, that shift in calling it, whether it's a, a national monument or not, um, this conception on just exactly what that did. Uh, all of that land is still federal land, fully protected, and the laws protecting those fossils not changed. It is still just as illegal as it was before to go and collect vertebrate fossils on those lands. Real difference is whether the federal government was going to be funding it or not. That's what changed. With less funding, you get fewer rangers, and it gets harder to um, enforce those laws thing is, I'm an advocate for education. Uh, um, it comes to enforcing the laws, that was always going to be extremely difficult, uh, no matter how much funding you got for how many rangers, because those regions have a lot of land in them, and it is really remote and uh, very difficult to navigate. People live down there, and they work it and they explore it a lot more than others. If we educate them, then they can do that. They understand just what those fossils mean for tourism in the state and therefore what it means for their pocketbook. You get people who live by those monuments on um, your side going to benefit from that a lot more. That's my take on it. So the last uh, part that you basically said, um, but it, it's kind of a very go good attempt to try and see if it's possible to not just speak with them on your own language while they speak their language in response, but uh, try to see if there is a way you can both speak, or at least from your side, there is definitely, I can, I've seen this attempt in your rhetoric here to actually try to speak their language. <laughs> So that it's yeah. easy for them to relate to this whole thing, to kind of put it all, you know, a full circle. Right, right. You know, let's find that common ground and um, inhabit it. But, uh, that, that's where I'm coming from. And I recognize that there are, um, you know, perfectly valid uh, opinions that would disagree with that. And that's one reason why the process is set up uh, democratically. Um, and, and why people ought to have a say in uh, that decision before the president signs uh, the executive order. So um, all, all, all that talk is pretty much to just illustrate exactly how complex these issues can be at uh, and exactly why that can be a big part of the profession. I'm not pretending that there are any easy answers in that, quite the contrary. And do have to make sure that how we are trying to figure out 
the ethical side, the political side, the, you know, all these other you know, somewhat more subjective sides. Um, don't let that away from the objectivity of the science. Yeah, that's um, this is one of the things I um, always try to remind people to. Uh, we, it's not just about what. Sorry about the background noise, by the way. Um, hang on a second. Just a second. Technical difficulties, it looks like. <laughs> not there a little bit. Uh, no, it's just that um, uh, I, my mom is washing the windows and it's making noise. Can you hear it right now or can you hear me okay? Just want to make sure. Because everybody is, you know, confined to the home right now and we are doing all the house stuff. So just want to make sure that it's clear. Is it clear? Yeah, yeah, you were getting a little bit of uh, that cutout that that we've had periodically. Okay, here, yeah, so. I've, um, I've I've knocked the window already, you know, to let them know that. Just come back to that later, <laughs> you know. Go on, <laughs> next one. <laughs> yeah. There's lots of windows, so it's fine. You can we, we'll be done by the time it's gonna go for a circle. But anyway, now I wanted to say that I, I'm really grateful for you to you know for being very honest about this general take. You know, you're not trying to play partisan here, you're just uh, trying to make clear what your interest is and uh, how may it's and the importance at the same time of finding common ground with the other side, whatever that may be as well, so that you can speak the common language and uh, find something that, you know, it's like a commerce, you know, it doesn't mean that we are both always going to get what we want out of it full, you know, full in full, you know, 100%, but by the time the whole thing is finished you walk away and uh, i gave you something and then i walk away and you gave me something as well so i think that's kind of would basically indicate a healthy exchange <laughs> so would be good so shall we address the questions maybe and uh, start you know release the tension of all these crazy ethical and almost philosophical <laughs> discussions, which uh, I admit, uh, sometimes it's a useful thing to talk about anyway, because we don't. I don't think it gets talked about at all in the right context. I think it's mostly about bashing the opposition rather than just looking at the issue in itself. So maybe we will do this again sometime, actually, and just really explore this in more detail, since I've actually, I'm actually learning a lot of cool stuff as well from it. So shall we address the questions, though? So... Do you want to do first? So, what was the first one? Um, uh, what? Okay, um, may, or maybe I should do the first one because I, I'm more familiar with the game side of things. Because it's uh, yeah. asking, what is the most accurate dinosaur game right now? Uh, how do I really answer this as honestly as I can? Um, there really isn't any. <laughs> Nobody has made that that I can actually say that it can be accurate based at least on the standard that I am that we have already established here that we're talking about the objectivity and science itself without any partisanship or bias or whatever. Because um, it's really uh, one of those things that uh, there are some things that they get right and they are amazing, but there are some things that they just get downright wrong that are just so dumb and annoying that and when and of course uh, I have this uh, thing I I am per it's my personal flaw of character I admit it so in case somebody tries to make any uh, Yahoo claims on in this direction just know that I admit this flaw of the character that I struggle a lot of times to separate the art from the artist and if I know something about the person behind the screen that I maybe wish I didn't or that's one of the reasons why I prefer not to get too close to, you know, developers and all that. Not any more than it's necessary to do the business, so to speak. It's because when I know certain things about them that I know I strongly disagree with, not just a matter of opinion, but just a matter of fundamental things about how things are done and how they treat their, you know, audience, etc. And how they respond to criticism. I'm not going to be willing to give these people my money to support their products. Unless I can see that this model of behavior changes, then I can talk business. But if uh, I, I only do business with, you know, people who I believe are willing to do it, you know, like adults, so to speak. And unfortunately, uh, gaming especially, and particularly when it comes to gaming projects that I've seen so far that I know of when it comes to dinosaurs are very problematic in that sense. I find them to be that way. 
And as I said, it's my character flaw. I, I struggle to separate art from the artist, but that's how I stand. Now, bearing that in mind, I, um, I do not know anything aside from maybe even the aisle <laughs> in terms of the sh that show the models uh, and again the aisle have got many things wrong as well don't get me wrong there's plenty of the models there that are just absolutely off the point but if i look at other stuff in comparison there's just so much other stuff that's just so messy and uh, some of it looks pretty but it gets things wrong other things might get more things right but they are just um, Again, they get other things wrong that annoy me and would just not want to make me want pay for the products, you know? Because uh, I I like things to be in the right place, and if I see that something's not in the right place, uh, I'm not going to be very willing to part with my money to support that product and thus reward that business model and reward that decision. Because when you pay for a product, you are rewarding the... Uh, you know, the person behind that product for whatever decisions they have made. And uh, I am a very strong when it comes to these kind of principles. And uh, yeah, this is where I stand on that. Do you, do you want to weigh in on this as well, Jeffrey, if you have anything to say? I, I think I'll combine um, answer for uh, both the questions, um, you know, what the most accurate dinosaur game is, and then... Um, ranting about uh, Saurian, um, as Z Boomer has uh, requested. <laughs> but, um, I, my take on it is that if, if you want to talk scientific accuracy in games, show me uh, a game that shows fossil excavation as mind-numbing, uh, painful, difficult work out in heat, um, with all the, the scrapes and bruises and cuts that, that you normally get, and that's an accurate dinosaur game. If you're talking about a, a game that is showing um, anatomical accuracy for a living dinosaur, there are so many different opinions and so many different interpretations of those fossils that it, it is really difficult to... Um, make that uh, a viable standard almost becomes a distraction uh, to the gameplay. Uh, and that that's kind of where I, I go off on uh, Saurian and its marketing. They market themselves as uh, providing the most scientifically accurate dinosaur game. Um, and that is an impossible standard. It is, uh, to be perfectly frank, loney. Um, because first off, whenever you see someone use the term scientifically accurate, they are um, clearly non science <laughs> coming from that perspective. Uh, scientists do not care about scientific accuracy, or at least they shouldn't, because and you end up with circular reasoning. A scientist has no business uh, creating consensus for consensus sake. Any sort of scientific consensus needs to be based in physical, say it with me now, physical, measurable, independently verifiable evidence. Yes, empirical, quantifiable evidence, guys. That's what we need. You want a science, you got our evidence. Hey. When you look at uh, Sarian's claim, they set up their um, game and uh, basically why they say they are scientifically accurate, uh, their, their claim just dissolves before your eyes. Uh, they're only taking um, uh, models from scientists that all agree because how else are you going to come up with a model that looks and, and feels like something that you can use in a game? Um, they, they tend to cherry pick some of these papers. Look at their gliding baby Dakota Raptor. Uh, they got that out of a scientific paper for sure. But that was speculation in a scientific paper. It was not explored in 
any um, in any depth that could justify it. When you look at it in game, uh, there's no way that the arms could even move the way that they have them. But also, uh, there's no way of telling what surface area of that wing would be, what surface area they did put um, on these supposedly gliding wings. Uh, just looking at it, it's not sufficient for carrying the weight of an animal that size. That there, there's no, I mean, they, uh, there, there's just so much about that model that is obviously not feasible. You don't even have to do scientific tests to look at that and say, that looks fun, but it's utterly ridiculous. Why are you calling it scientifically accurate? Uh, and you know, I could go on and on about that, but that's that's the root of my problem with Saurian and a lot of different games. And it make any sort of a claim that they're being scientifically accurate, uh, or that claim just dissolves under examination. Do you know what um, else I wanted to add to this? And it's important that you have brought up the last part about um, how they actually make that claim. This is on their banner. It's almost like their manifesto, you could say, pretty much. And uh, Word for it. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's right there on the front page of their website, unless they changed it, but uh, it was there. And while at the same time I'm seeing under the banner, I see this image right at the forefront there. There's like a headshot along with a few other creatures, but like it's a headshot of a T-Rex, quote-unquote, because that's not a T-Rex. Um, it's got you know, grisly looking lips fluff all over the place, you know, and just, um, just a complete mess. And, um, they still have a fluffy tyrannosaur on, uh, like, are they, are they still promoting that even after they change the model? I don't know because every time, uh, even I, what I do know, because I haven't, you see, I haven't really kept up because the question just came up and, uh, you know, it's a very easy thing to do. In fact, uh, <laughs> if you want, we can uh, quickly have a look. We might as well. I mean, yeah, that... I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do it now and tell you. So it's kind of dumbfounding. Oh, Sauron. I actually were... accidentally typed Sauron. Sorry. <laughs> 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 I don't know if it's a coincidence or if it's meant to be that way. Um, it's interesting. Their uh... ratings on Steam are like three out of five right now, and. Uh, 20 bucks for a game, apparently. Well, well, hold on a second. I'm not seeing where the... Okay. Where is the... Wait a minute. Am I missing something or am I not seeing the... Okay, is this the website? Let me just click. I almost thought that the website was gone. No, it's it's there. No, we still see it. Right there. This is the... Uh, yeah, it's still there. It's right at the front. Grizzly looking hippopotamus, whatever the fuck it is. Sorry, my language. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, that's, you know, their choice. Oh, I got some nice artwork coming in here <laughs> from people. Oh, yeah, sorry. Just need to go back to the thread. Uh, oh, yeah, Z Boomer just posted quite a lot of cool stuff. I just know, I thought it wasn't, I thought I accidentally clicked on my private messages because people send me their artwork sometimes, you know, to tell them what, what I think. And, uh, yeah, I just got... Okay, we'll, we'll get to that in a second, Z Boomer. Just stay with us. But in any case, yeah, to also address it, other games I've not seen try to make that claim, aside from maybe Prehistoric Kingdom, which is supposed to be like a uh, more kind of down-to-earth, so to speak, simulator of a prehistoric type of park, which has a bunch of different animals, uh, including dinosaurs. And uh, the funny thing is, when uh, they were confronted by somebody, uh, not myself, by the way, uh, about their dinosaurs, their theropods, having lips, quote-unquote, they said, well, uh, I don't know about others, but we want our dinosaurs to look healthy. That was their answer, and uh, that's when I realized that they just don't know what the hell they're talking about. Uh, okay! <laughs> that, that, I've never, I, I've not heard that before. <laughs> I mean, when I when when I first I th who was it? I think it was either Iram or someone else who basically showed me a screenshot, and I don't have it at hand. 
But um, yeah, when I first saw that, my um, my reaction to that was just very plain and simple. Two words. Fuck off. <laughs> oh, I, I, wow. I, yeah, like, uh, I, I, I'm trying to unpack that statement and all the presumptions and assumptions that had to have been founded on that and I just sorry my my, my brain is like <laughs> in malfunction mode that's just so absurd I can't even <laughs> I mean uh, how it's just it's so it's such a loaded statement you know it's such a loaded statement uh, I mean I can tell you exactly what it's loaded with and uh, it oh yeah yeah, yeah like ho- horse shit would be the first thing that comes to mind <laughs> Oh gosh, yeah, that's wow. Okay, yeah, sorry to interrupt. That's yeah. just <laughs> this is no, no, but seriously though, that's what the thing is. They make that claim, but I don't see any, you know, actual at the front page any credits given to the research material cited of the papers. I actually brought this to one of their devs. Uh, everybody knows who it is. It's R.J. Palmer, and after that, we after we had that exchange. I was somehow, it all kind of interjected into me being called an istophobe of some type, and uh, uh, then, uh, yeah, I got blocked, and uh, then I exposed him, his hypocrisy for what it was, and etc, etc, so we basically went into a bit of a back and forth, which I'm sure you heard of, and uh, it's been featured on my channel, so it's no secret, and eventually he, we just kind of stopped doing it, (laughs) and uh, I haven't heard from him since. So yeah, but uh, yeah, as you as I the point I'm making is that nothing good came out of me actually trying to uh, interact with their side of things, uh, with that side, and present my arguments and actually give an honest feedback as a potential customer of what might win me over to give them my money. And uh, I, as as a customer, I can I have all the right to be entitled to anything when it comes to my money. If I pay for it, I am entitled to see what the quality is. They don't have to meet my demands in particular, but that means that they're, they're not going to get paid from me. Maybe there will be other 10,000 of people in place of me who would be willing to pay for that product, but I've not seen the evidence of that yet, so I'm not going to be making any definitive claims. In fact, I haven't seen any evidence to really understand how well they are doing in general, other than the reviews on Steam, which are very mixed and are not particularly high, because 3 out of 5 is not a very high score for a game, because it means there's a lot of negative reviews there as well. What they're based on, I don't know. There may be good ones, there may be some very trolling ones that have no context, whatever. I haven't really looked into it. Point is that this is what I'm seeing, and... uh, I made it very clear many times as well that if you want me to buy your product, uh, show me that it's worthy of my money. Because I don't know how people out there, maybe if I was a millionaire celebrity, I could just toss it around like crazy and would not care. But I'm not in that position to do that, you know? <laughs> so uh, I, uh, I have to be very selective about what I spend my money on and it's a matter of principle. So, um, do you have anything to ch- chime in on this uh, anymore, or shall we go and look at the Z Boomers drawings and maybe give some feedback on that quickly as well? Uh, we can move on. I, yep. I've ranted. I'm, my I'm happy rant. as well. I'm, I'm, I've ranted as well, and you know, <laughs> I dropped a few f bombs there and then, and that's pretty much what it was about. <laughs> so, seems like that's all it was, pretty much to say. Nothing else I can say about that. So, let's look down the list. It's in the same order. See Stan. CU, AMNH, Fabo 27, and Scotty, since we're talking about Tyrannosaurus. Um, okay, um, okay, uh, okay, okay, mm-hmm. <laughs> I like this, it's, I'm just like, uh, just so you know, I'm pointing my mouse, uh, you know, uh, thingamajiggy at the portraits as well as we speak. And um, first thing I noticed and I wanted to highlight is the, again, I've, Pretty sure I said that on um, in a private chat somewhere, but uh, with me and Z Boomer. And um, first of all, it's nice outline overall, very well done. I like the restoration of the rough areas. Uh, teeth seem to be on point. The jaws, from my point of view so far, seem to be on point. 
what I would say is change the nostril orientation. It shouldn't be like the elongated hole sideways. It should actually, that area there should be covered. And this bit here should be pointing that way. So this should not be there like that. It should be more like a circle here. So, Jeffrey, do you want to input on something here as well in regards? Because yeah. we have a, we have a Whitmer at all 2001, by the way, study, guys. Uh, so be sure to check that out. And and I can scroll back uh, at some point earlier where I posted my uh, Allosaurus work in progress. And that basically follows the model of nostrils that I'm talking about when it's more forward, kind of aligned and facing rather than completely sideways with open wide holes like that. So, sorry, Jeff, go on. One, one second. Bless ah. you. <laughs> it's, uh, in, in, our, uh, so, uh, in, in our kind of uh, Russian su superstition that uh, back in the days when I used to, when I lived there, the, whenever somebody says something and then the person after that, whoever it is, sneezes, that means that everything that's just been said was true prior to the sneezing. So, there we go. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, there we go. Like, kick proof you know that's that's proof guys that's that's proof right there there we go Sometimes. solid because but yeah yeah sorry to cut you off go ahead no, don't worry no i was just saying that it's proper legit and shit but uh you you, you go ahead and give us your input on the portraits please just what, what do you uh, think okay. um so uh about the only note that i would uh put there would be um i don't think uh, the lines around, like showing where the skeletal nostril and the antorbital fenestra are, I, I don't know that that's really serving anything. You wouldn't see that on uh, the animal itself, anyway. Um, I understand, like you know, th there's kind of an impulse to have to put them there because you look at these skulls for so long, and it just doesn't feel right if you leave those out. But uh, wouldn't see that on on. Uh, original animal one way of uh, uh the living animal and one that might kind of help with that be to put a little line kind of bridging where you've got the gap here and you're just suggesting the antorbital fenestra if you were to put uh maybe a a, a little shadowed line kind of like what you've got there um bridging the two things the bottom that would show a little bit of the uh, the thickness of the maxilla, um, in you're kind of coming from a, a more cartoon uh, line drawing sort of a style. Um, that line there a little bit, and that that'll help to to suggest that. But that you can leave that off, and and it will look perfectly fine. But uh, a, a lot of the other aspects of this, uh, you know, pretty particularly as a series, love how this illustrates how different Tyrannosaurus uh, individuals could be in the face. And it's great that, like, you can look at these and recognize them and say, oh, yeah, that's Stan, that's Sue, that's uh, kind of nickname by nickname and, and so on. And uh, that, that really makes me wonder. We know that uh, Tyrannosaurus uh, had a habit of Hitting each other on the face, and so is that the reason why those faces look so different? Um, it says a lot to what their their potential sociality uh, could be, and if they've got you know, different faces and they could recognize each other um, just by looking at each other's faces. Um, it's it's really like it's telling. like talk about face rearrangement. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, they, they could rearrange each other's faces. It's, it's, ah, it's like, so. it's like I, I think you would look prettier with a bit of a gash over there. Hang, hang on a second. Chomp. Scar that up. <laughs> oh, so, you know, and, and I'd like to see, uh, you know, the uh, um, treatment as well with those, uh, that crazy one tooth that is just so fang-like. I mean... Uh, that's one of the funny things that I've noticed just kind of comparing these is that I, I tend to look at the teeth because they're so snaggled uh, it's really easy to tell uh, differences in individuals thing is is that uh, it would be a constantly changing feature of the living animal 
And so you can do that with the dead ones, but you can't do that with the living ones. Oh, that's a really fun series. I, I appreciate you sharing that. I think it would be really great, um, Z Boomer, if, uh, like, since you've already started doing these. Uh, in, so before you start, before you expand, you know, completely to all other attacks uh, that I have seen you show, because I've seen, like, uh, he's done uh, Giganotosaurus, he's done a uh, Dospletosaurus Terosus, and uh, Ceratosaurus as well. And um, I was going to suggest maybe focus on, a, you know, on an individual taxon and try to just what do like this type of in-depth you know study um so we get to see different like whether it's going to be portrait or full body maybe you can do like full body version of one of them uh like an adult and then do a full body maybe of a juvenile and then do like portraits and by the way like is a very bad parasitic word i need to stop using it and um, <laughs> <laughs> and um do perhaps you know uh, a collage of um the portraits together you know that would be really great i think this could actually come out to be a very cool piece of artwork once it's finished it's gonna take ages to do and get it all right and in the place you know because good pieces like this when you work on them long enough they do take a lot of time and energy and just generally they can take ages but I think, um, Z Boomer, you're gonna be very proud of yourself if you are going to do it that way that I just described. And uh, yeah. and I think there's gonna be really a good breakthrough for you to just do something that's just 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 be a madlet and do it. Basically. Do it. Kill him now. So yeah, sorry, that's <laughs> palpatine coming forth. <laughs> um Yeah. This is the bit, I think, uh, with these lines of finestry that Jeffrey was talking about, just because I have the mouse pointer here, since I'm doing the screen cap, so these are here. I don't think you need them on any of them, because um, they would likely be hidden. What I think he can do, and Jeffrey, you feel free to let me know if this is something you can weigh in as well, is rather than outlining the lines of the fenestre and may, you can just use maybe smaller uh, scales, slightly smaller, slowly kind of transitioning from the larger ones that go on the edges of the snout and slowly transitioning into smaller ones uh, in a softer area to indicate that this area may have been a little bit softer and more, I don't know if it was actually movable or not, but uh, you know, this is a way to kind of do it, but at the same time without really doing it. So it's almost, I almost call it cheating. Does that make sense? Yeah, if you're going to uh, put a uh, scale texture on there, that that could be a good way of doing that. Um, but I, I, I wonder if it, if it is some kind of an instinct. I mean, get so used to seeing... Uh, the skeletons that uh, sometimes sometimes it just doesn't look right when you cover that up, but it, it, it does need to be covered up. It's also important to note that this, uh, the idea of this whole syndrome of visible fenestry, it's a Jurassic Park related pet peeve that I have. I have good things about Jurassic Park and I have some really bad things that I absolutely slam Jurassic Park for. And this is one of the things that I slam them for, is basically the visible finestry uh, thing that just... I don't even understand what was the justification for it to begin with, you know? Not to say that uh, whether there was anything specific that studied it, but it's just... Uh, this is not something that we see generally in animals, you know, like this. It's It doesn't work like that. It's, uh, it's a completely different way of uh, uh, doing well, it. Especially looking at the Indominus Rex, you know, one reason I think they put that there is to emphasize uh, the skeletal look, and that gives it a little bit more of like a Grim Reaper sort of a feel. Uh, there's a lot of iconography that goes into that art because you have to get so much information. Um, that's the visual, um, it, you know, there's a little bit of fudging that, that kind of has to happen. If you're going for a restoration and have to move away from that, regardless of what the uh, iconography is, 
you're yeah, not trying. It's, it's it's basically more just follow what you see based on the fossils and evidence and just understanding the anatomy without the images because oh god do i have to say how long it took me to get rid of the habit of always being tempted to make to go down certain tropes when i was trying to do more you know realistic looking animals uh, specifically tyrannosaurus and uh, i it's almost like reflex by inertia was trying to take me towards the direction of making them more like jurassic park t-rex and uh, I kept slapping my wrists about it quite a few times. In fact, it took me a couple months to get used to doing it properly. Months, <laughs> you know, after having... So I'm pretty sure many people will relate, but just so you know, I've been there as well. So it's it's fine, but it's a good idea to practice and build up the skill to not go down that path too much. So, Jeffrey, would, would you like to say anything to... Have you got still any time uh, on yourself, or have you got to be at work at any point now, or do something uh, else? Probably, probably just a, a little bit more time. Um, we were we're kind of promising the epic rant. On, yeah, let's do uh, a pr- an epic rant as a finale, and uh, I will give the mic over to you hundred percent, and I'll just keep my mic on just for the sake of occasionally letting people know when I'm gonna be laughing my ass off. But yeah, <laughs> carry on. <laughs> Okay, so um, the question was asked about Raptor Rex and any relationship it may or may not have had with Carbosaurus. And the reason why I get kind of in rant mode when it comes to that taxon uh, is because I happen to work in the museum that housed the lab that prepared the holotype. So I saw that skeleton go from mess in the rock to uh, a, a fully restored um, mounted skeletal copy. Um, day by day, I, I looked at it every day, and that's the perspective that I'm coming from. I want to make it clear that I haven't studied it uh, from a formal scientific perspective. I know the people who did, and uh, I I've examined those arguments very uh, carefully as a result. So uh, the story with that is that uh, uh, a fossil dealer by the name of Hollis Butts, who uh, at the time, maybe still, uh, was working out of Tokyo, um, he uh, sold uh, this specimen, definitively identified as Electrosaurus, uh, to, I cannot think of the guy's name right now, Kriegstein. Uh, is his last name because uh, they named Raptor Rex after him, and that's the species name. Um, and he hired uh, Western Paleontological Laboratories uh, to create a skeletal mount for his den. And the original plan was to, to mount the original skeleton, and since it was Electrosaurus and there were already um, scientifically described specimens of it, that's of the direction uh, that they were going with it. So as they started pulling bones out, and by the way, this was a beautifully preserved specimen. There were a number of elements uh, that were still articulated. Bone was in very good condition. I vividly remember, and I I think I even have pictures, uh, the the neck and kind of the curve of the neck and um, it relationship with the head and uh, on and so forth. So, you know, great skull on the thing. Uh, just really well preserved. Remember uh, the preparator kind of complaining about uh, some of the prep uh, that they did in the field, which is common for preparators. Uh, you know, they, they shouldn't have used this. They should have used this uh, consolidant, you know, like that. But uh, good ways around it. Um, and the main preparator, uh, he actually didn't participate in the scientific description because there was some hope that uh, they would name this new taxon um, Archaeotyrannus hunteri after him. 
which I think is a much cooler name than Raptor X, but that's my opinion. Reason that a went ahead with uh, trying to describe a new taxon based on it, it was originally identified as Electrosaurus, is that started taking some measurements in order to make sure that they were uh, preparing things correctly, which is uh, pretty standard from some of the labs that I've worked in. You know, you want to make sure that you have a good anatomical model of what you're working on uh, so that you're not flying blind, so to speak. So they, they took some measurements from visible elements and tried to match them up with Electrosaurus, and they couldn't do it. There were too many differences, and so they brought this uh, the attention of um, uh, of of the client and convinced him to give the original to science that he could get a uh, a, a cast copy. They bent over backwards to make it happen like this, and so to their credit, they once they figured that that they had a new species. It, they really uh, went to town to try and make sure that it got into scientific hands, and I, I really uh, admire and respect them. So, um, around that time, Paul Sereno came to uh, the Museum of Ancient Life, where uh, their lab was situated, for a different project. I don't recall what the project was. I think that's where he heard of the situation and ended up... Um, doing the description. He was the lead author, uh, if I recall. Then um, one of the other, uh, one or two of the other uh, people who worked in Western were uh, co-authors. So thing is, is that uh, Sereno's lab, uh, since they were um, going to be the repository or the original specimen, once it was all prepped out, uh, they were going to be doing the description and then uh, the preliminary work that Western had completed uh, was going to, to figure in that paper, and that's why uh, they were co-authors. When that paper came out, it was uh, very disappointing because some of the claims did not match uh, what the preparators had seen in that. Um, for example... Uh, paper mentions uh, some features of the brain case and draws some conclusions from that. And a uh, preparator who pulled the skull out of the rock was adamant that they did not cover any brain case material. We're already seeing some discrepancies there. Um, and so that, that, uh, um, that was kind of a shadow on the whole... And then you had uh, a, another set of folk come in uh, and examine that, which you know was very good that they did that uh, because the the paper was deserving of uh, re-examination, and they did a good job of uh, some detective work, and they came to the conclusion that ontogeny carries the day, and that therefore this was a, a juvenile herbosaurus. Um, there are some problems with, with taking it that way. Uh, for, for one thing, he argued that okay, the original paper said that Raptor Rex individual that was recovered was um, skull sutures and skeletal elements were all fused. So it concluded that it was uh, nearly fully grown. The paper, uh, let, let, let's call it the um, uh, uh, response paper. Uh, the response paper said that ericosaurs, the sutures, will often uh, fuse from individual to individual, and that it's not a good indicator of whether an animal is uh, a juvenile or not. You can get juveniles with fused skull sutures, for example. Uh, the problem is that is the timing. 
uh, the Raptor Rex specimen is only about as tall at the hip as I am. Uh, this is a very uh, small for, uh, for a Tyrannosaur and call it a juvenile uh, Tarbosaurus doesn't make a lot of sense to me it, because those uh, skull elements and everything being fused at that age, uh, uh, at just that size, uh, that's really hard to swallow. But the other thing that makes me think that this is not a juvenile Tarbosaurus, even if it is a juvenile, um, be a, a comparison of the morphology of the bones. If you look at the skull of um, Raptor Rex, for that, the uh, of anything called a juvenile tarbosaurus, you don't have to take measurements. You can see at a glance that uh, there are some uh, pretty significant differences, especially at the back of the skull. Uh, juveniles tend to um, to score basal, and you work in phylogenies because uh, phylogeny kind of or ontogeny kind of recapitulates phylogeny uh, in, in certain respects. So the younger an animal is, the more it's going to look like its evolutionary ancestors is kind of the short version of that. So if Epterex is on that ancestral line towards Tarbosaurus, then yeah, juvenile is going to look like Raptorex. They do not look exactly the same. That leads me to the final point um, Electrosaurus was recently uh, lumped into Tarbosaurus as a juvenile, so you end up with an either-or situation. If Electrosaurus really is uh, um, a juvenile Tarbosaurus, which, you know, it, it, incur it occurs in the same sorts of areas, there's nowhere Electrosaurus specimens are coming from, so um, that, that helps to solidify that claim. If Electrosaurus is a juvenile Tarbosaurus and Raptor Rex cannot juvenile Tarbosaurus because the very preliminary measurements and, and, and so on, uh, those measurements do not match up with Electrosaurus. So Raptor Rex could be a juvenile Maybe it could be a juvenile raptor rex. It's, it's got to be some kind of a distinctive taxon. It might be, oh, if I wanted to spitball, just say maybe it's a, a, a juvenile Zhu Cheng Tyrannus. I, I, I could buy that. But with the evidence that we have right now, uh, the, it just does not seem feasible that Raptor Rex could be a juvenile Tarbosaurus, and I don't think that the examination uh, was done in early enough detail to establish that as a probable um, identification. May I that quickly, um, sorry, Jeff, I just quickly wanted to put something on the table here. Do you remember from that paper if um, they actually compared the young and juvenile specimen of a Tarbosaurus, which we, by the way, have as a part of the collection in a museum in Moscow, because there is quite a good growth series of Tarbosaurus there, starting from a juvenile, all going all the way through intermediate and to that. Oh, there's like about four or three or four specimens at least in that museum that they could have used to compare. Do you know if that was cited or you cannot remember? Uh, no, it, it did not go into detail um, comparing skeleton by skeleton. Uh, the, the response paper uh, hinged mainly on cation, which is kind of, kind of the odd thing. Because of the way that it was collected, um, we don't have a locality for it. That's the big problem with raptor eggs. Uh, is also a problem that it seems like it's kind of the bone of contention, if you'll pardon the pun, uh, for everyone involved with trying to figure out just you know, how to identify these bones. Got um, uh, Reno's argument that it came from northern China, 
And there are two papers that uh, refute that uh, and, and say that it comes from Mongolia. Uh, Hollis Butts was working out of uh, Mongolia. Uh, that's where his, his fossils were coming from. So uh, it is most likely a Mongolian uh, dinosaur. But we don't know exactly where it came from. And yet, based on that lack of knowledge... That's pretty much what the response paper uh, based its claim on. If it's coming from Mongolian sediments, then it must be a juvenile Tarbosaurus. And didn't didn't really check that very rigorously against uh, the morphology of skeletal elements. So, there's, uh, there's another point to add uh, to what you said earlier about Electrosaurus maybe possibly being basically a juvenile, young, whatever, younger... Um, Tarbosaurus. For that to be true, and again this is where we go to the point how reliable this conclusion is, and this lumping, how justified is it, is that this would imply, because they come from different time periods, although adjacent to each other by the way, um, because Flaming Cliffs formation predates uh, Nemect formation. Uh, locality is very much similar and the same in some ways or form and shape etc they kind of do you know overlap probably or at the very least close enough you know to be considered but they predate each other um, I mean the, uh, the uh, okay Flaming Cliffs predates Nemect just so I understand Nemect is where we see all of these amounts of different Tarbosaurus specimens come from and there's quite many of them actually many of them that have not even been properly documented and described and they are and many of them are housed in uh, Ulan Bator in Mongolia uh, bo in both in whatever amount of collections they have I think they have two or three museums there that house them and uh, the important point that I wanted to make is um, if we only have one specimen that is associated with Electrosaurus and there is no other similar specimen or a Tarbosaurus specimen Going from coming from flaming cliffs, how do we justify lumping it together if we have to overcome the step to actually even prove that Tarbosaurus existed in that same time period as well as an earlier than just the Megd formation, stands stretching all the way back to when the flaming cliffs formation was because the fauna actually changes quite significantly when you compare the flaming cliffs with the uh, Nemegd formation. They are quite different. So I thought, how does that work? You know, it would be interesting to examine that a little bit more. Yeah, well, and, and that's a good point. Like, the identification kind of rests on the assumption that uh, everything in Mongolia uh, that has dinosaurs in it is uh, late Cretaceous. And Cretaceous was a very long time period. If you don't have locality information, and that is a significant part of the fossil that is... Uh, basically destroyed um, and trying to identify it on the basis of something that you don't have uh, but just a generalization on well you know there there's a lot of Cretaceous stuff in Mongolia that, that that's not adequate by any means I'm hopeful that uh, sometime in the future uh, somebody will revisit uh, uh, Raptor X and uh, some of that work to compare it with uh, juvenile tarbosaurs and uh, pull out uh, those points and say, you know, this isn't uh, an electrosaurus, this isn't a juvenile tarbosaurus. Uh, there's there are just too many measurements that don't um, don't compare. Also hopeful because um, I've been doing some work with the regional paleontologist here, uh, Greg McDonald. And uh, he's developing a technique which, which he's been able to use uh, to combat fossil piracy. Um, dinosaur bones, in fact, all bones, uh, have radioactive uh, components to them. And uh, we have devices now that can measure that radioactivity and um, arrow, uh, like come up with a, a specific signature. Um, even with uh, um, drone analysis. And these devices help us to pinpoint 
uh, whether, um, whether a bone came from a particular quarry or not. Uh, they've been using it uh, when, when, when they've come across uh, different fossil bones. We'll get the story from uh, the person uh, dealing in them or uh, we'll get the claim and they'll go to the quarry where they say this person recovered it from and uh, the, the signature of that quarry and compare that with the bone, the signature is the same, then you know, they, they can establish that this person was telling the truth. But there have been times when they, they were able to narrow down that it came from another quarry and that that person was collecting those fossils illegally and hide about it. So I'm hopeful that uh, one day we will be able to identify um, with much more reasonable um, data exactly where this animal came from. And at that point, you know, we'll, we'll be able to figure out uh, just exactly what is going on with this specimen. It's really, you know, the whole thing has been kind of uh, tragic in a lot of ways. And there were a lot of missteps along the way. Uh, a lot of good things that happen with it, but... Uh, Raptor Rex uh, didn't get uh, the attention that it deserves, and it certainly didn't get the name that it deserves. <laughs> it should be Archaeotyrannus! Uh, well, um, is, it, uh, is it time for you to... Uh, is there any excuse we can, you know, insert <laughs> your favorite, you know, skits into this whole... Uh, thing to slowly s and you know p prepare it for a wrap up since uh, we we are nearing the point of almost reaching I believe it's yeah we are almost at two hours uh, measure now and uh, I think that would actually be a good time to wrap up pretty much and since I have another session coming up as well so <laughs> I will have to obviously you know uh, we have to be a bit tight but yeah. Uh, Optimus Prime voice. I think, I think we've checked all the boxes. If you want Prime voice, I, I can add that. Do you, do you want me to kind of close out the session? So as, anybody, uh, uh, and, uh, type in the comments, everybody here, who wants to hear uh, Jeffrey to speak with the Optimus Prime voice? Quick. Type. No type. one starts. It's hilarious. Okay, there's a do it. <laughs> yeah, there's a do it. Yeah, do it. <laughs> oh. This has been talking with di uh, talking about Dinobots with Optimus Prime. If you like this video, subscribe and like it and do all that cool stuff because Optimus Prime recommends it. Uh, shall I do Imperial uh, Emperor Palpatine then and uh, my own version of the outro? Shall we do that? So let's see if I get any do it for this. Okay, yeah, I gotta do it as well. From the same guy, but who cares? <laughs> if there's one guy who says do it, then we we, we have to. So, <clears throat> just clear my throat a little bit. Uh, make sure you subscribe to the channel. And if you do not, you shall experience the full power of the dark side. Zap. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna do the full scream when he goes like unlimited power because <laughs> that's just gonna you know <laughs> that's just gonna break everything here. Yeah. I mean I think even then they had to tone it down on the microphone uh, in editing just because you know he had to actually uh, Ian McDermott actually had to scream recording that I think <laughs> <laughs> that's one of the reasons when they were in a uh, Star Wars uh, I think it was like a comic con Star Wars thing and um, uh, he's uh, actually said I can do anything you want guys but just please don't ask me to do the unlimited power thing <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, Z Boomer, thanks for stopping by. You have a good day as well. And uh, if you have any more of that cool artwork you want me to review or you want to show to Jeffrey when he has time, we can both look into it. So feel free and uh, have a good one. Autobots transform and roll out. All right, Bye. guys. That's I guess that's a good uh, point to wrap up and. Uh, We'll see you guys when we see ya, and uh, we'll come up with 
some other topics for you to talk about. In fact, you can suggest and uh, we can probably address it. So, shall we say that's it, Jeffrey? We're done, aren't we? Yeah, okay, cool. So, everybody, bye-bye. Ciao.